Coming up on WordBirds. He said it took him three years to buy a car. He had never owned a car before. And it took him three years to make the decision to buy one. And he attributed the delay in making the decision to the fact that he was completely overwhelmed by the amount of information that was out there when he was researching. Hello and welcome to Word Birds, a birds of a feather conversation amongst people who care about words. Today on the show, we have Isabel Papoulias. She is the CMO at Backbox, the network security device automation company. Today, we're going to be talking about the value or lack thereof of long form content. I know, controversial. The idea that it's a buyer cycle, not a sales cycle, and how, provocatively, less is more when it comes to sales content. Let's sit back and get some insight from the flock. What could you do with a 90% reduction in content errors, a 70% increase in content quality, and a 60% reduction in content editing costs? Probably what our customers are already doing. And that's creating better content faster. Acrolinks, the amazing content company. Hello, Isabel. Welcome to the show. Hi, Chris. Great to be here. I'm very excited for you to be here. Let's go ahead and jump right in with the quick fire. Let's, let's talk about your best and most successful content campaign, what would it be? It's not a campaign name, it's the approach. It's a holistic campaign with a core theme that plays through various different content types. And what is your worst content campaign type? Same thing, it's less of a, oh, yes, it's a, it's a content type, so it would be long form content, like oh. uh, guides and ebooks. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back to that, but out of the two, um, where do you feel like you learn the most? Tough question. The first one, probably. Okay. Um, I want to come back to <laughs> the very controversial statement that you opened with. Um, this is going to be a very special episode of Word Birds because we're already going to be in a conversation about things that most people don't think. It's a kind of provocative statement at the beginning. You think, you just said, long form in ebook not the most valuable. Explain yourself. All right, I will, I will, I will justify this. Okay, and I'll give you a specific story, right, for my, my, my last company, uh, my last role. Um, look, I worked for a sales enablement leader. So we had content management software that enabled us to see not just how content was being used, like what was being downloaded or used, but truly how, um, how the, the audience was reading the content, how much time they were spending on it, where they were stopping, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and for the longest time, to be clear, long form content worked well for us. But then something happened and I remember it was during COVID in fact, so I can't really explain why it was during COVID, but that's when we saw the trend. We noticed that um, people weren't reading the long form. They were opening it, but they were not actually spending time with it. And what we saw instead was an increase in engagement with more snackable content, uh, videos, but also things like checklists, uh, you know, 10, thing, 10 ways to um, evaluate a sales enablement vendor or uh, five things to look for when you do whatever, right? So we, we followed the data, we looked at the data. It wasn't us deciding that long form, you know, wasn't working. I mean, the data was clearly telling us that and there was a pivot moment where that happened. Uh, and that was pretty clear. So do you, st I'm buying what you're throwing down here. So do you still create the long form as the base and then create the derivatives from it and the derivatives are the value? Or do you just start with, with snackable content? So great question. And again, I'm in a new role now in a new company. Uh, I'm two and a half months in. Uh, absolutely. We are looking to create long form content as well. Right. And then we'll we'll uh, try to understand as best as we can the engagement with that and, and tweak from there. I mean, I think fundamentally, um, you know, best practices are fine, but ultimately you have to benchmark against yourself. So I th I, the way I approach is when, when, um, when, I, when I build the content strategy, I, I build it with a pretty open-minded uh, approach. And I do think there's a little bit of you have to try different things to see what works for the 
the company you're in, right? So what might have worked somewhere else may not work in this new situation because the buyer is a lot more technical. So, so for example, Backbox, uh, we're um, a network and security device automation company. Our buyer is, and our end user is the network engineer. They're extremely, extremely technical. And when I'm seeing so far, I say this with a grain of salt when I have months into the job, it appears that they do like very long, very technical, what many of us would consider boring content, you know? Um, and uh, and if that's what they want and that's what works and that's what we need to go build. Now, are they, are they your buyer or are they your user? So um, both depending on really what the size of the enterprise, right? Um, the more upmarket you go, the, the higher, the, the larger the company, you know, we're talking like if it's 10,000 employees and up, a very large enterprise, there's usually a hierarchy uh, where the buyer and the end user are not the same. But most of the time for the space that we play in, they tend to be one and the same, which is interesting. It's an interesting finding for me. And that's because really network teams are understaffed compared to security teams. Right. Uh, they're a bit of, and, uh, and so there's less of that hierarchy, right? And then, and, and often, more often than not, the end user is empowered, is also the person who makes the decision because there's just not that many people. There, he doesn't have, a, she or he don't have a boss over the boss over the boss, and they're empowered to make the decision. That's, so that's, that's interesting because then, I mean, your long term content is both an attracting force. For, for inbound leads, mm -hmm. it's also educating in the middle of the funnel. Are you then cutting that up and turning that into things that can be used by the folks that are around that initial contact, that lead that comes in? So whether that person is the economic buyer or not, there's something that can be driven out from that original piece of content. Exactly. And I can't give you a clean answer on this because, again, I'm, I'm just now diving into the, the content strategy, but that's absolutely something we're looking at. And I'll give you another example. Our pitch deck as it stands, let's call it a pitch deck, I hate that term, but you know, our sales deck for the first discovery call uh, is, as it stands today, appears to be, from the feedback we're getting from the sales team, appears to be a little too elevated for the, the prospects that we're talking to, who most of the time are the end user. It's a little too educational. Let me tell you about the challenge, et cetera, et cetera. But the end users, by the time you talk to us, they know. I mean, they, they understand network automation. They understand the challenges. They know why they're calling us. They just want to understand how the product works. How are we delivering on their challenges? Right? So, and so we're, ta we're, we're developing a, a second sales deck, which we're calling a practitioner deck, which is more of, let's call it like the, the pre-demo to the demo. If that makes sense. So if you if you're pitching, it is, this is interesting. If you're pitching mm -hmm. to that practitioner and you're mm -hmm. doing a conceptual hello deck, introducing the business, you're saying I'm, what I'm hearing is that could actually slow down the deal because mm -hmm. it's taking them backwards from the, just show me what you do. Where, where yeah. do I put the keys? Where does the key go in the box and make it run? And I'm trying to explain the value and the problems that I think they're experiencing, whether they are or they aren't, versus just saying, let's take your interest and parlay that into mm -hmm. a next a next step. Let's just get mm -hmm. you to move forward. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because I think that's what a lot of, I mean, when you look online at the perfect sales deck, it is always that like introduce the tagline, move into the challenges in the marketplace, mm -hmm. tell the customer what their challenge is that they're seeing, then explain how you solve that challenge. And I I've been having a lot of problem with that lately because I think that you know we as a business at Acrolinks we we tell you what the challenge is. So as a person in marketing, I will tell you what you're dealing with, whether you're dealing with it or not. And if what I've hit on in my hypothesis isn't at the top of your list, I can talk you into why it's important, but it probably moves to the bottom of your priority list versus the challenges up here that you're actually dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And if I could if I could attach to one of those, then I'm in a priority path. And you're you you're identifying that depending on who you're talking to, you can get right into the priority path right away. Yeah, I mean you still have to you know double click for a bit on the challenge, understand their challenge, right, very quickly so you can then get into the more of the nitty gritty of their product story, if we want to call it that that way. Again, it's not a demo, right? At that mm -hmm. at that point, but 
so you can tell her the rest of the the, the, the conversation. But it's a little and to be to be to be fair, I know you. I think you're having the same reaction. I it's different than what I'm used to. You know, as marketers, we yeah, like you said, we start with a challenge. I mean, I have a methodology I usually uh, use for sales decks, which is you know challenge. The close challenge, loss, opportunity, solution, evidence. Pick any other acronym; it doesn't matter. More or less, that's the structure, right? And all of a sudden, now we're saying, okay, well, don't spend quite as much time on the challenge and the opportunity because the the buyer gets it and and go faster into the product. It's a little, it feels a little contrarian, um, but that seems to be what's needed based on feedback from the sales team, based on listening to sales calls. And so look like any, anything else, like we'll test it. And I think the best way to test something is actually through the field, mm-hmm. right? They're truly in the trenches. They're hearing directly from prospects. The most valuable insights to me come from sales calls. Oh, absolutely. Yes, we can do other things. We can test on the website and do other things. But truly, the the, big, the most important source of information comes from sales. Do you, do you use a platform that allows you to record your sales calls? So we do not. I wish we were. Uh, we will at some point in the future. I'm sure we're not. We're not quite there yet. So right now, it's reminding folks to use Zoom, please, and record right. your calls so I can listen to them. We uh, we use Salesloft, and it's still a challenge. Uh, it, it's. I mean, I just got off a great call. Oh, cool. Can where can I go to listen to it? Oh, yeah, I didn't record it, and it's a bummer because that's like you said, that's the best feedback you can get is how does this meeting go? But I think that you know the interesting thing here is that, I mean, mileage may vary depending on the type of company and the type of product, but once a product hits more of a mainstream position in the market, it's not that educational sell. You don't need to start at the beginning and really pitch that huge value message of this is the challenge you're having and this is Mm -hmm. what we do to solve it because people should understand it more. And I mean, where you are in networks and security device automation, that's a thing that people understand. If they're looking for that, they understand why they're looking for it and what they're looking for. So spending a lot of time up front in that challenge doesn't Mm -hmm. seem to make as much sense because I know why I found you and I know what I'm looking for versus Acrolinks of three years ago where you didn't know you were looking for content governance software. That wasn't necessarily a thing. We got to tell you what it is up front. But with the advent and and mass release of generative AI, all of a sudden people know why they're coming to us. And the time that we're spending trying to prove that we're a thing can start to go away because people know we're a thing. So you want to tune a model. Yes. You want to tune a model on your Mm -hmm. best content. Yes. How do you know what that is? What do you mean? Well, what do you do for content governance to better understand the content that you own and how it's performing and what you want to use to tune, tune your new model? Oh, okay, cool. I get what you do. And now we move away from that into how do we do things differently? How do we do things better? And how do we make you a better, better doing your jobs? That changes the way that you structure that messaging, I think. And, and to be clear, that, that first sales deck I mentioned, the more elevated one, let's call it the more, I don't know, expected, uh, there's still a place for that one, right? Uh, if we are very on market and uh, we're talking to um, a very senior executive and there's it's more of a thought leadership discussion, then that's that's the right that's the right type of content. Amazing. Ama- this went in a lot of different directions that I didn't expect to go, but I love it um, because this is something that we deal with. Like this is real time for most organizations. You're never done with that introductory deck. It's always a thing in progress. Um, We have, our head of sales has a version that he's working on. I have a version I'm working on. My product marketing team has a version they're working on. And yesterday we saw what the salespeople are actually using. And none of those things are the same. So just constant iteration. That has never happened to me. No, no, God, never. Um, How do I lock this slide deck thing? Anyway, um, let's talk about you. So Things I know about you, um, builder, connector, sort of a globalist expert. Um, let's dig into that connector because I think that's a thing that we deal with in our role quite a bit is, is company alignment, um, you know, collaboration across more than just your organization and sales. That's what people expect is that you know marketing and sales work closely together. But there's, there's more than that. And I know from your past experience and, and where you just arrived, that's a lot of what you think about. How do you how do you think about that idea of being a connector? 
Wow, that's a, that's a loaded question. Let me see, how do I start this one? I mean, first I will say as marketers, as you know, head of marketing, CMO, whatever your title is, we're inherently connectors. I feel like we sit in the middle of the organization um, and we have to collaborate very closely with sales and product, uh, but also CX. Uh, we have to influence the customer experience, you know, end to end. Um, so I think that it's a, I want to say it's a responsibility that we have, whether we, you know, consciously know we have it or not. And it's a skill that we develop, uh, one way or another over time. Uh, now for me, it also happens that prior to getting in this, you know, fun tech business, I was in uh, global account management and major agencies, some of the biggest ones, advertising media agencies. And I was always uh, handling, um, marquee brands and teams around the world like we're talking you know 150 countries and, su and such so i feel like i i train my connector muscle a lot because in that role what you have to do essentially is getting um all of these markets across the world to march to the same drumbeat right the same global strategy but in a way that's localized and makes sense for the market so there is and so there's a there's a i'm going to call it even like basic herding the cats thing in there right and constant communication and um, convincing people to maybe do something that they don't really want to do, right? So um, that help, that just has, has, helped, has helped me uh, to become a better connector. And then more, more recently, because be, before this new role, I was in, in a corporate strategy role. So that, you know, that, that is a lot about alignment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, leading executive offsites, leading the LT on behalf of the CEO, all those things are about encouraging communication, collaboration, and 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 driving consensus. I don't know if that answers your question. It correctly. does, and I mean, I think you know the idea of uh, there's this central business experience role. Um, I mean, I don't want to call it the customer experience, but the the way the business feels, looks, communicates, um, interacts in the marketplace. And a lot of that starts in brand, which tends to live in marketing um, and spreads out from there. So it's not, you know, this front office versus back office mentality. There's a lot that a CMO can influence throughout the rest of the business for the betterment of what we're doing in the front office and the reach that you've had into, for instance, product organizations, mm -hmm. um, reaching in to make sure that, for instance, the right products are being built, that you're able to get the right product market fit, that things are falling into place so that you have the tools that you need to be successful. It's, it's more than just that. I talk to the sales people a lot. And that's mm -hmm. it, it goes well beyond that. And all of that leads back to your ability to speak the language of the business fully. If you don't understand, if you're that marketing organization that doesn't really have a solid handle on what you sell, that's a problem. If you don't know how to communicate that, you can't create the content that drives that. All of that comes together by you being central and having that visibility, that 360 degree view of the business so that you are the communication hub, even if there are communication organizations that fall outside of that technical documentation teams that create content, support teams that are creating content, there's an experience that's coming from you in the business to make sure that all those people are aligned. Yeah. And I love the word experience. I also love how you mentioned 360 and yeah, I mean, look, as as um, marketing leaders, we have a huge amount of influence. Again, whether we choose we choose to have it or not. That's the position we're in. I mean, I think it's a wonderful thing, but like you said, in your product, I mean, we we influence pricing and bundles and how the, the thing goes to market because we have to be able to market it, right? Employer branding, HR, you know, we have a point of view there. We're, we're working with that team. Um, sales, I mean, we just discussed, you know, the sales deck. We have, we're influencing that as well. I mean, so, so it's, um, it's fascinating to me. I mean, I think that's why it's, it's such a great role um, because we're touching so many different parts of the organization and in some ways we're making all of them better. I'm, some people may disagree with us, but, you know. Um, <laughs> I hope not. We try. We're trying. <laughs> trying we're really trying hard. to make them better. We're trying really hard to make them better. Yes, that's better said. Exactly. A thing that I like to do 
towards the end of episodes is the PSOTD. That is the provocative statement of the day. It's a, a mechanism that I use uh, in my day to day to be able to say a thing that is somewhat controversial, provocative, to start a conversation. Often I don't know that I think it, but if nobody's saying it, we're not going to argue about it. So I like to ask, what is your provocative statement of the day? Okay, it's about content. You're going to hate me for saying this. I hope Um, so. You want provocative, right? So when it comes to content, I'm increasingly feeling that less is more. Let me tell you why, right? So I think we have a tendency and we know that, you know, more content, more content, more content, SEO, keywords, all that stuff, right? Um, But Brent Adamson, you know, formerly from Gardner, I forget where he is today, um, which company he's working for. Um, I was on a webinar where he spoke, I think it was last year, and he he kind of shared this idea and he he gave the example of like, look, he said he, he said it took him three years to buy a car. He had never owned a car before. And it took him three years to make the decision to buy one. And he attributed the delay in making the decision to the fact that he was completely overwhelmed by the amount of information that was out there when he was researching. And his perspective was, yeah, and his perspective was, and that resonated with me. I mean, I, it really did as a, as a, not as a, forget about me as a marketer, as a, as a buyer, right? As a consumer. Um, and then he said, look, he's like, don't even, don't feel the pressure to create more content. Your competitors are already, are already doing that. If there's already a, you know, a guide, a long form guide about your industry, don't necessarily create that. See how you can actually use your competitors content and educate your buyers on how to better navigate the confusion of content that's out there. And so his recommendation was focus on shorter pieces, frameworks, lists, next steps, again, things that help them navigate what's already out there rather than throwing more content on the pile of confusion. Now, I'm not saying I've solved for this, but as I think through the content strategy for Backbox, it's something that's very top of mind. But, I mean, generative AI says that you can have 20 times the amount of content you have today. Right now, you don't want 20 times the content? I don't know. <laughs> it seems like a lot. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I I, obviously, I I'm being. So. It, does, it doesn't feel right to me, but you know, I. I, I, I think. I mean, the interesting thing that you said that really stopped me in in my tracks was that you know you can't make decisions because there is so much information, and now we're on this the the precipice, looking over into this pit of new information that's going to be created um, by robots, and <laughs> if you can't buy a car now because there's too much information, how is this new 20x, 50x amount of content going to help you make a decision? And your your provocative statement of the day is it's not. It's going to make it harder. And I think that's something that listeners need to take away from this, is that there is a balance. And I mean, you started with less is more. More is not necessarily better. The right content to solve the mm-hmm. right questions is the right amount of content not just content for content's sake. Because if Mm -hmm. you slow down the ability to make a decision because people are plowing through hundreds and hundreds of pages of content, you're not closing deals. The right content closes deals. Now the challenge to you is what is the right content? And that's what our job is apparently. And it's not easy, but you know, that's why I always go back to, I like to go back to the customer journey. You know, that's the, the guiding principle, you know, look at it through the eyes of the buyer. And I, that's also why I, when I speak internally, I talk about the, the buyer cycle, not the sales cycle, because I like to remind myself and remind the teams that, um, our job is not to sell, it's to make it easier to buy. I know these are you know kind of cliches. It's not like I'm inventing these words, but you know they're there for a reason. And I do think that's powerful. So if we, the more we can think about it through the eyes of the buyer, I think the better the content strategy will be. But I do think it's it's easier said than done. 
I wish I had a perfect answer, or magical answer, or someone had it for me. Uh, I think we're all trying to figure it out. But that that is the thing. It's it's identifying what the pathway is, shortest distance between two points, to get an opportunity to progress from start to finish and close one. And that if we knew how to do that, if there was a button that you could push, we'd buy that software and we'd all be pushing that button all day long. Um, that's why there's us. That's why there's people trying to solve this problem. Isabel, thank you very much for being on the show. This was fantastic. Thank you. Always fun to talk with you. Thanks for listening to Word Birds. Word Birds is hosted by Chris Willis, produced by Charlotte Baxter Reed, and brought to you by Acrolinks. For more information on Acrolinks, visit www.acrolinks.com.